And now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, the Reverend Dr. Jamie Clark Souls. Um, when we editors were choosing our theme for the conference, um, we um, very quickly decided that Dr. Clark Souls was the ideal person to come talk to us about this. Um, in addition to being a professor of the New Testament at Southern Methodist University's Perkins School of Theology, she's also the director of the Baptist House of Studies at Perkins. She received her BA from Stetson University where she focused on philosophy and Russian studies. And she has a master's of divinity degree from Yale Divinity School and a PhD in the New Testament from Yale University. Her particular areas of interest include Johannine literature, evil, suffering, death and the afterlife, disability studies in the Bible and women in the Bible. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Clark Souls. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me and for your opening words and words of introduction. What is the name of the poet? Mary Oliver. Oh, Mary Oliver, of course. Yes, the good, good, good. I did not know that poem, and I, I know a lot of her, her poetry. Um, so the rabbis have a saying, turn it and turn it again, for everything is in it, and contemplate it and grow gray and old over it and stir not from it. I think they would have loved the title of our conference, Scripture in the Christian Life, a source of inspiration and conversation. So I love scripture. I teach it, I preach it, I exult in it, I puzzle over it, I talk back to it, and sometimes I even live it. I especially enjoy exploring it in community. So of course, I was glad and honored when the editorial board of Lumen et Vita invited me to participate in this conference. And what a rich offering of topics that we have here today, really showcasing what you were talking about, showcasing the variety of ways that we can engage the topic. So I look forward to learning from my colleagues, the presenters, the rest of the day. Preparing for the gathering made me realize that I've been writing about this for a very long time, and it's actually likely that everything I've ever written, honestly, has been motivated by the theme our organizers have chosen. My dissertation is called, are you ready? How many people are PhD students in here? Okay, so here you go. Scripture cannot be broken. The social function of the use of scripture in the fourth gospel. In it, I consider how scripture functioned in the Johannine community, the Qumran community, and the Branch Davidian community under uh, David Koresh. I even made a really involved table, like you do, <laughs> uh, charting the many ways scripture served each community. The next book I wrote um, explored what the New Testament had to say about death and the afterlife, and not just because I needed a book for tenure, which I did. Um, but because I had served in the chaplain's department in Connecticut hospice. As I listened to the wide variety and sometimes conflicting ways clients and their families construed what was happening, I wondered what scripture had to say about it. Then my book, Engaging the Word, the New Testament and the Christian Believer, it really does delve in quite directly to the questions we're asking at our gathering. So I'm not here trying to self-promote and I'm not going to march through uh, all the, the other books, but I will say that throughout my career, there's been this thread of how we engage scripture. What do we mean when we say scripture is authoritative for our lives? How does our social location affect our engagement with scripture? What are the political and ethical ramifications of how we interpret scripture. So I love scripture. And now faith, hope, and love abide. And the greatest of these is love. I also, don't you think it's kind of interesting that it's not faith? I just, every time I read that, I'm like, how come it's not faith? You would think it'd be faith, but love tells us something. What about, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Perfect love casts out fear. God is love. So I bet you could add many others. So if you want to jot down or think in your own mind to, to think of scripture that inspires. 
the first part of our um, conference title. So scripture, a source of inspiration. Do I love every word I find in the Bible? No, I do not. I could do without. I permit no woman to have authority over a man. A woman should learn in silence with full submission. Or slaves, obey your masters. Or Jesus talking to some of his fellow Jews saying, you are from your father, the devil. So note to yourself or jot down at least one scripture that you find problematic. And that's the other part of our theme, scripture, a source of conversation. Scripture is our shared language, and it gives us shared language. It connects us with our ancient siblings in the faith who knew both moments of glory and days of devastation, but who, like us, lived mostly in the in-between ordinary. When we commit to learning the language of scripture, it connects us to each other here and now. If I say to you, my son is in a far country, I need you to know what I mean, what I'm feeling, what I'm grieving, what I'm hoping for, without having to spell it all out. And I hope you're inspired when you hear Paul declare that death doesn't have the last word. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? And interestingly, Paul himself is drawing on his scripture when he makes this wonderful proclamation. So it's kind of like scripture inception, right? So in those three lines that I just read, he quotes from two different prophets. So Hosea 13, 14 which says the part where it says, where is your sting? And then he draws from Isaiah 25, seven, uh, where the prophet says that God will swallow up death forever. So I think this is powerful as it stands, but if we also know the fuller passage of Isaiah 25, the meaning becomes even richer. And I think the hope becomes magnified and I think it expands God's glorious victory. So listen to this fuller context. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. So Paul quotes Isaiah 25, 7. But when you hear 25, 8, then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, you automatically think of what New Testament text? Revelation, good. Do you know where? That's actually impressive. You got Revelation. But yes, yeah, so I won't put you on the spot, but I do carry it with my students. I carry usually a bag. I couldn't pack it because I had to pack a lot of coats and sweaters and boots. <laughs> Basically, everything I own, I packed to do layers to come here. Um, uh, uh, so normally I carry Bible treasure bag with me. So you you really are owed a Bible treasure for, for knowing the answer to that. Um, so I'll give you an IOU. So it actually occurs in two places in Revelation. So Revelation 7, 16 and 17, you hear this. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. But it also occurs in Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. So John the seer actually quotes that passage twice. So also, I've been especially fascinated by scripture quoting scripture uh, since I took up that dissertation with the very unwieldy title that I mentioned. Uh, and it's one of the topics I just, it's one of the few topics I write on over and over throughout these whole 23 years since I graduated from my PhD program and uh, 30 years since I graduated from seminary. Um, so uh, there's a new book coming out that I'd like you to know about called uh, Israel's Scriptures in Early Christian Writings. Um, if you're interested in this topic, um, Matthias Heinze and David Linkicum are the editors. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. 
Humans are meaning making creatures. Our New Testament authors knew and relied on scripture to make sense out of their lives. So you might say that scripture helps us to interpret our lives and our lives help us to interpret scripture. Every jot and tittle, every jot being Yoda in Greek. So every Yoda and tittle of scripture that we add to our repertoire allows us to connect with God when we can otherwise find no words, to connect with one another more deeply, and to connect with our own selves, which is probably the trickiest of all. In that engaging the word book that I talked about, I said the following, if the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us, that is, if the word of God came out of the birth canal of a woman's body, grew, ate, went to the bathroom, bathed, struggled against demons, sweated, wept, exulted, was transfigured, was physically violated, and rotted away in a tomb just before being gloriously resurrected, then the Bible must have flesh on it. If a valley of dry bones can live again, then bones and blood and bread and flesh and bodies should never be left behind when we are trying to understand the grime and the glory of scripture. Any interpretation that denounces the material created order, including our own bodies, should be suspect. From birth to death, our bodies swell and shrink. They are wet with milk and sweat and urine and vomit and sex and blood and water and wounds that fester and stink and are healed and saved and redeemed and die and are resurrected. If we can't glory in or at least talk about these basic realities in church while reading scripture, then how can scripture truly intersect with or impact our lives? So I want you to think about your own yourself and your own community. If I were to ask you in that community, why? Why do we interpret scripture? Why do Christians engage in it? And we also want to ask about how, but let's start with the why. So I'll throw some out and you can add to it uh, in our now or in our uh, question and answer time. So of course we read for historical purposes. We believe God acts in history and we stand in a long tradition. It was here long before we were born and will continue long after we die. So we naturally want to understand what was it like for our ancient siblings to be Christians? Um, and how did our Christian tradition develop over time? Who are these great cloud of witnesses whose legacy we are? We read for ethical insight. What would God have us do? How do we know what is good and what is not? Turn the other cheek, go the second mile. Do not repay evil for evil. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a sibling in need and yet refuses help? Now we know, and I'm sure through the course of the day, we'll be talking about this, that using the Bible in ethical decision-making is not always as straightforward as one might think. Since at some points, the Bible reflects and supports practices that modern Christians would find unethical, as we said earlier, slavery. Further, some issues are no longer live for most of us, such as whether or not it is proper for a Christian to consume meat sacrificed to idols. And so in this case, we have to decide how do we read that scripture and how does it work in our own lives today? This is actually one of my very favorite things to teach in intro. I just taught it uh, last week because, yeah, no one cares. Students eyes like what's idol meat? Who cares? But when we read First Corinthians 8 through 10 and we watch what's at stake and what it means for how we do community and how we care for one another, you know, it's same stuff, different century. Uh, so how we use it, you know, the idea that we just pick it up from the first century and plop it into the 20, you know, 21st century. Uh, sometimes, yes, but sometimes it requires a little more nuance. And then, of course, there's the idea, uh, how do we decide when to be specific, you know, which things are timeless and which things we need to do, you know, with use our analogical imaginations, as I call it. So by analogy. Um, so, uh, yeah, some folks want to get very specific about not getting drunk, but seem to ignore the pastoral prohibition against jewelry, case in point, uh, braided hair, right? So how, how do the, uh, the ethics work? Uh, 
and it, and also the question becomes, I think everybody here would say, so we, I think everybody in the room would say scripture is authoritative. And I think everybody in the room would probably say scripture serves as an ethical guide, right? But in what way? So I like this statement by uh, the famous, I don't know if you all know Robert Withnow, he's a sociologist of religion. And I love this saying, he says, in an otherwise secular society, the church must in fact be different. It must do strange things to provide a place where the voice of God can at least be imagined, if not actually heard. Clergy do well when they make outrageous statements about love and forgiveness, and congregants do well when they make the even more outrageous attempt <laughs> to put these statements into practice. So scripture certainly helps us as we explore and determine how we might best conduct ourselves but of course, it's best when it is engaged in a studious, nuanced, informed manner. Uh, scripture can also function in the way great literature does, right, in certain ways. So Tobias Wolf uh, is a short story writer, if you know him. And in the beginning of uh, one of the short story collections, he says these words, and he's writing them about short stories. But as soon as I read it, I thought this is also, I think, how I... Uh, one way I see scripture. He says this, and it sounds a lot like what you just said, Dean McCarthy. Um, that sense of kinship is what makes stories important to us. The pleasure we take in cleverness and technical virtuosity soon exhausts itself in the absence of any recognizable human landscape. We need to feel ourselves acted upon by a story, outraged, exposed, in danger of heartbreak and change. Those are the stories that endure in our memories to the point where they take on the nature of memory itself. In this way, the experience of something read can form us no less than the experience of something lived through. So if you take a moment, can you think of stories in scripture? What comes to mind for you? Stories in scripture that have affected you deeply in some way. If you think of that story, think of which one, and think of why that story. Scripture also serves the church liturgically. It shapes the way we conduct worship from the lectionary to hymns, to the words of institution at communion, to passages depicted and quoted in our stained glass windows. So Will Willimon, if you know who he is, he has a book called Preaching to the Baptized. And I like what he says here about scripture. He says, when you join Rotary, they give you a handshake and a lapel pin. When you join the church, we throw you in the water and half drown you. <laughs> Ponder that. Whatever signing on with Jesus means, it means that we will not do just as we are. That change is demanded daily. Sometimes painful turning and detoxification that does not come naturally. He says, in baptism, we are taught to find our strength in God and God's people rather than ourselves. We are prepared for the shock of moral transformation by a cleansing cold bath. We are born, drowned, adopted, clothed, gifted, so that we might be a people worthy of listening to a peculiar account of human life called scripture. Many of the problems the biblical figures face, we also experience for better or for worse, but much about our world is different from theirs. At every turn, Christians are able to read these texts and ponder the convergences and divergences of our experience and knowledge with that of our ancient forebears. From there, the modern church must decide what it all means for us in this time and in this place. And I, I hope in the question and answer period, we do talk about what we mean in this group by scriptural authority, because I think there are a variety of traditions represented in the room. Um, and I think that's an interesting topic. So that's a bit about why. You know, we could also, I'd be also interested to see what you would add to the list of when we think about why do we engage scripture? Lots of different reasons and different entry points. Then of course, the question becomes how? Do we engage scripture? So I think it's an incredibly exciting time uh, to be 
involved in inter interpreting the Bible together, thanks to uh, the variety of tools and approaches at our fingertips, right? Not just accordance Bible software where you can do the most amazing searches um, and really get lost. You have to tell a friend you're going in, I would say, and have them check on you. So you come back out. <laughs> like, why did I go in here? What was I looking for? Because this is amazing. I was just telling Davis last night, present, uh, preparing for this lecture, I found this puzzle in Isaiah 25 that we're going to go figure out, right? Because um, that might don't have time right now, but there's a puzzle in Isaiah 25. So we have wonderful tools like that, that we can study, but we also have interpretive uh, tools. Um, I want to read a quote from uh, Sharon Ringe and Frederick Tiffany. They have a book, it's older now, but this quote still applies. The book is called Biblical Interpretation, A Roadmap. And the quote is this, the Bible is an open book. Women and men from a variety of theological traditions, ethnic communities, economic strata, ages, physical conditions, and sexual orientations have been reading it for centuries. At different times, people in all of these circumstances have found themselves empowered by the Bible, challenged by it, confused by it, restricted by it, and harmed by it. They have sought to understand it, to interpret it, to control it, to obey it, and to escape it. People love the Bible as a source of life and light and truth and hope, and sometimes they hate its power. You and I are somewhat similar, somewhat different, and that matters greatly for how we interpret the Bible. Our age, gender, race, ethnicity, social class, religious affiliations, or lack thereof, childhood experiences, personality types. So how many people in here know their Enneagram type? Some of you, okay. It would be so fun to ask you to share. Over lunch, over lunch we can share. Or how many of you know your Myers-Briggs type? Okay, same. Okay, we have things to talk about. So, so your personality itself, life experiences, where we're from, where we're going, where we'd like to go. All of these are part and parcel of what makes us us and influence how we interact with the Bible. So we have learned much from feminist, womanist, muharista, liberationist, disability, and post-colonial analysis, and from sex and gender studies that opens scripture up for us in new ways and gives us some new entry points, especially some of us um, who may in the past have felt or even been told that scripture doesn't really belong to us or our group. So I know some of our speakers today, if you've looked at the program, will help us with some of these approaches. There's actually a panel that's uh, dedicated to feminist interpretation. There's, so there's feminist analysis, uh, queer and trans analysis, um, one on the Book of Ruth, um, and then Sister Hua is doing one on um, Vietnamese immigrants and refugees. So there, it's just um, wonderful for all of us, right? Because we all grow and learn. So it's a very exciting time. Thanks to personal and professional encounters I've had over the past years, um, five years especially, I'm currently writing a book called The Agony, the Ecstasy, and the Ordinary, Experiencing God in the New Testament. I do think I've come a long ways since the dissertation phase. <laughs> so my question is, have you ever experienced God? Have you felt near to God? Have you felt distant from God? For you, how do our scriptures become a site of divine encounter? How might our scriptures occasion a divine encounter? How do our scriptures help us to make sense of God's presence in those times of agony and ecstasy? or the quotidian mundane. So in writing this new book, I've been really excited to discover all kinds of fascinating and transformative work being done related to the Bible and emotions, called affect theory, um, the Bible and the senses, the Bible and neuroscience, the Bible and altered states of consciousness. Uh, your very own Dr. Angela Kim uh, Harkins is a luminary uh, in all of this. If you've had her for class, you've, you already know some of this. Uh, she's 
just leads out in lots of ways around religious experience, emotion, uh, et cetera. If you, uh, in addition to her work, if you don't know the names of Anathea Portier Young, Brittany Wilson, Deborah Forger, Dorothy Lee, Janine Hanger, um, or the work that Dr. Harkins is part of a religious uh, uh, experience in antiquity, SBL group. These are all great places and names to start with to get into the conversation. These are all fresher, newer, very exciting uh, avenues of research that are going on. Or you could just email me and I'll just send you a, a photo of the giant, giant stack of books in my study uh, right now that I'm working through. Few scholars speak as eloquently about scripture as a source of divine encounter than the Catholic biblical scholar, Dr. Sandra Schneiders. Uh, she is a member of the Sisters, Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Uh, she specializes in the Gospel of John, which is where I live, uh, kind of, but she's a very broad scholar, and she has she does a lot with the text, the revelatory text, the text as a site of revelation. So, uh, you know, the first ending of John, you know, John has two endings. I'm sure you know that. If you don't, John has two endings, one at the end of chapter 20 and one at the end of chapter 21, and the first ending goes like this. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. So that's the passage that she's responding to when she writes these words that I think apply well to our conversation. She says this, the other signs, and we should take this term broadly to include all that Jesus said and did, the other signs not recorded were done in the presence of his disciples. In other words, they were part of the earthly life of Jesus and helped form his first followers into disciples. But in the mind of the evangelist, those not recorded are not crucial for later disciples, however much we might want to know everything about Jesus. Rather, only those things that are written in the gospel and as they are written in the gospel are necessary and sufficient for later disciples who will come to believe through their reading or hearing of the text and thus become and remain disciples of Jesus just as truly as his first disciples. This is very important, she says, because it locates the revelatory encounter with God in Jesus, not in one's experience of the words and actions of the earthly Jesus, which was available only to a few followers in first century Palestine, but in the engagement with the gospel text, which is open to all people of all time. Revelation is rooted in the life of Jesus in Palestine in the first century, but it occurs in the faith life of believers in the community shaped by the text of scripture, end quote. She also says this, the evangelist then goes on to say that these events and words of Jesus are written to bring you, that is the reader, to belief. In other words, the gospel, which undoubtedly served a purpose in the Johannine community of the uh, late first century, has in view primarily those who would encounter it later, namely readers who had not been part of the life of the earthly Jesus or of the Johannine community. We are not assigned to try to extract from recalcitrant ancient materials historical information that can then be remolded into religiously significant material for contemporary faith. We are not, in other words, eavesdropping on a past conversation or spying on an ancient community of which we are not a part. The gospel was written for us, and it addresses itself to us, not primarily as scholars or historians, but precisely as readers. While scholarly historical critical work is crucial for the church's understanding of the background of the sacred text, it is primarily in the literary experience of reading or hearing, of allowing ourselves to get caught up in the Jesus story that is being told, that we are drawn into the salvific revelation dynamic, end quote. Now, of course, how many folks in here are Catholic? Okay, that's what I thought. And I'm Baptist. 
so we can have fun ecumenical conversations um, over lunch. I was just telling Andrew, I just took 100 women to the Holy Land in January, and most of them Protestant. And their encounter when they go into very ornate churches and some of the things they say, like, we need to do some ecumenical work, you know? So they're like, oh my gosh, I can't worship in here. It's like all this stuff, you know, in the way. I was like, okay, so the stuff uh, has name. All those things have names. And for some people, that's the actual avenue of worship. So let's uh, let's have a conversation. <laughs> and I told him, oh my gosh, this is ad lib. Oh my gosh, my poor person whose name will, and denomination will remain unnamed. Yeah, yeah. So if you have, how many of you been to the church in the nativity? Yeah, so you know when you're down where by the star and then there's Jesus, you know, baby Jesus, you know. And the anyway, my, my wonderful colleague, you know, who was leading a devotional about that morning when we had gone to the church in the nativity and it was like, you know, and then there was that idol um, over there. I'm like, okay. Um, yeah, so we all have work to do. So these, this is good. <laughs> this is good that we're all together having these conversations. So uh, as Catholics, of course, uh, you have a regular practice. I think probably many of you have Lectio Divina, which a lot of your Protestant siblings have never heard of. A lot of your Baptist siblings have never heard of Lent, by the way. Um, uh, we can talk about that. Uh, so others participate in other rituals centered on scripture. Uh, so what I want to do now in the next uh, 15 minutes that we have um, together to play before the uh, question and answer period is I'd actually like to read through a text together just to flesh out the conversation. These are all concepts and ideas uh, but let's actually dig into a text. So I want to dig in together um, to uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Um, and before I do, I want to just remind us. Uh, so Paul, um, Paul um, ha you know, has lots of experiences. And he'll, he talks in different places about ecstatic. So he has extraordinary spiritual experiences, let's say many of them, right? And so I've categorized them as ecstasy. So many of you know Greek, so truly ecstasis, so standing outside of stasis. And he he narrates many ecstatic um, experiences that he has. Uh, so first he talks about, uh, you know, his call or conversion. I put it there because we, we typically talk about Paul's conversion. It's a little questionable whether Paul had a conversion, right? Because he's already Jewish. And, uh, but at the very least, he was, he was called. So we hear that kind of language. You know, in Galatians 1.11, he talks about um, receiving. He wasn't taught by anybody. No human being taught him anything. He received a direct revelation from Jesus. He says it a number of times in Galatians 1 uh, and following. He talks about visions that he has, and we're going to look at that in our passage in 2 Corinthians uh, together. Uh, so we'll talk about his visions there, visions and revelations. Again, apocalypsis is the word for revelation in Greek. He talks about signs and um, signs and wonders that he does and might, mighty works. Um, he himself apparently has the gift of tongues, right? You remember the famous passage in 1 Corinthians uh, 13? He says, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, if I have prophetic powers, and at first you might be thinking, oh, he's just being theoretical, but then later uh, in 13 and then beginning of 14, we learn he does actually have that gift. So when he tells them to calm down and bring it down a notch, it's not because he's jealous or sour grapes and doesn't have the gift. It's because as always, he's worried about how does our practice um, invite others in to the story of Jesus. So he talks about speaking mysteries in the spirit. Um, he wishes all of us could speak in tongues, uh, etc. So there's many places we see Paul talking about uh, ecstatic or uh, exceptionally uh, exceptional spiritual experiences. But I, I find it interesting that if you counted, uh, he really tends to focus a lot more on hardships that he and the apostles uh, suffer. So these are generally referred to by New Testament scholars as parastasis catalogs or hardship lists. And there are lots of them. We obviously don't have time to read them all uh, right now, but uh, just to share um, 
to share just a couple of them. Um, he says, um, there's a lot of them in 2 Corinthians. We'll just read a couple. So he says uh, in 2 Corinthians 1, 8, we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly, unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. It's a bad day at the office, <laughs> right? Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death so that we would rely not on ourselves, but on the God who raises the dead. He who rescued us from so deadly a peril will continue to rescue us. On him, we have set our hope that he will rescue us again. As you also join in helping us by your prayers so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Um, one of my favorites to do with my students, I just love this, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 9. I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, as though sentenced to death. Because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to mortals. We are fools for the sake of Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. Sarcasm is thick here, right? You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we are hungry and thirsty. We're poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we grow weary from the work of our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we speak kindly. We have become like the rubbish of the world, the dregs of all things to this very day. So to set this in context, uh, the Second Corinthians 12, something that I find uh, incredibly interesting um, well, I guess first, first I would ask you, as we talk about those things, so the ecstasy, you know, these categories, I am curious um, if you have had experiences, right, that you, what would you put as your, your ecstatic moments, maybe you have a story of conversion, um, when you had those moments, what was the setting, again, was it occasioned by reading scripture, fasting, you know, kind of just thinking about it. And then, of course, the question is, if you have had ecstatic experiences, where did scripture factor in, if at all? How have you integrated those extraordinary spiritual experiences into your faith? That's one thing I'm kind of having conversations with people about as I write the book. And then, of course, people who are willing to share uh, I'm also curious about experiences of parastasis. If you were going to make your own parastasis catalog, again, how did scrap scripture factor into that experience, right? So when you read, when we read this, uh, this passage, we're going to read 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and following. So I want you to listen for Paul's, I want you to feel Paul's duress, right? And think about, um, yeah, you have, you suffered. Um, have you asked God three times, like Paul will do in a minute, to uh, and Jesus, who asked three times to have the cup taken? Have you asked God over and over again to take this thorn from you? Have you ever experienced power made perfect in weakness? So again, the whole question of how do we integrate hardship and suffering into our life of faith, and where does scripture help us? So. Uh, let's just look, take a look at this passage. So it goes like this. It is necessary to boast. Nothing is to be gained by it, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body. I don't know. God knows was caught up into paradise. I know, I, and I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. Who's he talking about? He's talking about himself. And he's doing it in the third person as an extra rhetorical flourish because if you remember if you studied first corinthians there's these folks coming behind him these opponents and they come with this big pedigree and you know they're all this they should be listened to paul's nothing he's not even a real apostle 
he has some kind of bodily weakness um, that is off-putting uh, that he refers to. Um, so he's he's that's the boasting. So it's an extra rhetorical. These are his own experiences, and he could spend the entire chapter just talking about those because they were really extra um, in terms of how special they were. So he says, on behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. So when he's starting to talk about suffering and hardship and where God is, then he starts talking in in first person. Right. So. He says, but if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering, by the way, the exceptional character of the revelations. And of course, when he says uh, he says he refrains from boasting, I mean, obviously he just did it. We just read it. So again, it's beautifully, rhetorically a powerful passage. So even considering the exceptional character of the revelations, then he says, um, he says, therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. So why, what tense is this verb when you hear a thorn was given me in the flesh? What tense is, uh, not tense, what um, voice? Is it active or passive? It's passive. And so who gave it to him? God, right? So this is just a divine passive, we call it a circumlocution. So you see, he's saying it's it, it was given him. That means God. And then it says a messenger of Satan to torment me in the same sentence. Then he says three times I appealed to the Lord about this. Again, the exact same number that we see Jesus uh, in the synoptics. Uh, three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I'll boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. He's not a masochist. He's not running out trying to find suffering right? These are things that happened to him in the course of, of living his faith with integrity. So for the sake of Christ, for whenever I am weak, then I am strong. So to me, we, we looked at some passages where he talks about ecstatic experiences, and we looked at some where he talks about hardships. But in 2 Corinthians 12, I really find it fascinating and gripping because it mixes two things that we might think uh, to be opposites, right? So on the one hand, he receives this gift, we see, of mystical experiences, these deep encounters with the divine. It's it's plural, so it doesn't just happen once, um, right? But on the other hand, he goes on to discuss, discuss this thorn in the flesh, also given to him by God. So ecstasy and agony. And you can tell he hates it. You can feel his passion in there, right? Um, Again, so Paul repeatedly asked God to cure him physically. Through his struggle, Paul experiences God revealing two profound, life-changing, ironic, because Christianity, as far as I could tell, is nothing if it's not ironic, truly. I mean, things are not as they appear. Um, so to me, there's, we could add more, but I want to name two profound, life-changing, ironic truths. One, that God's power is made perfect in weakness. We are in Lent, right? So look at the cross, exhibit A. God's power is made perfect in weakness. And in fact, God's grace is enough, is sufficient. So you could add other lessons that you think Paul learned from that. Um, in terms of our theme of inspiration and conversation, at least two things I find inspiring about this. Uh, I love, so, so we, you know the passage, we probably all know the passage. We have this treasure in clay jars so that may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and doesn't come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. How many of y'all have been to Corinth? 
Okay, so you've been to the Asclepion. Okay, so if you haven't been to Corinth, it needs to be on your bucket list. You need to go. It's an amazing place. And when you go there, you will find this. So, uh, so the Asclepion, so the god Asclepius was the uh, ancient god of healing. And so what folks would do is take whatever body part was ailing them and make a clay, have a clay figurine made of that body part taken to the temple. That's what they wanted healed. And it's really fascinating. I, I'm not gonna take the time to show you the brain, but I really found the very intricate brain extra interesting that, you know, in first century, they're kind of, yeah, like, whoa, okay. There's some definite science going on for them to know the brain. And I will tell you, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, blow this up, but there's no body part that was not prayed for or having an ailment. So when you go with your teenage children, just be like, look at those legs. Um, uh, but I want to bring it up because you know, he talks about having a treasure in clay jars. He's in Corinth. These things are made of clay. He's talking about healing and suffering, right? And not only that, you will see actual clay jars. So again, the context of how he's how he's getting that imagery. So I love that Paul models honestly voicing what is hard. This is what I find inspiring, that he honestly voices what is hard. It does not make you a whiner or unfaithful or an immature Christian or a downer. It makes you a human being who has the courage to speak truthfully about struggles. So again, right, what goes on your peristasis catalog? I love his honesty about his struggles. I also love his call to let go of perfection as flawlessness. He's very happy to use the word perfection, but it does not entail flawlessness. And so I love to kind of, you know, you have the treasure in clay jars, right? And then I don't know if you all have seen this kind of art, the Kintsugi. I just love it. My mom introduced me to this. She's an artist. And so the notion is, so you have the clay, the clay jar, and when it breaks, right? You, you think we would throw it away, but instead the artist takes it and fixes it with gold, thus making the having been broken item more valuable than had it never been broken, right? So, um, so those are two things that I absolutely, uh, absolutely love, uh, and we could add more. So, the question then becomes the second part of our of our theme has to do with conversation. So those are two inspiring things. I have lots of questions when I read it. So I won't name all of them, but I'll just kick it off by saying, how can God and Satan both be involved at the same time in Paul's construal of his suffering? Right. We have an Old Testament scholar in the room, so he'll say Job on the one hand, right? He's, Paul is actually drawing, we could talk about this. He's drawing on Job uh, when he's making a reference in there, because obviously the Old Testament, Satan is an accuser, et cetera. So he, again, there, he's not quoting scripture, but even there, when he is trying to make meaning of what's going on in his life, he alludes to and has the Job story uh, in, in his mind. So um, of course, I think uh, there's folks in here and Dr. Davis himself and, uh, um, works on disability. So this passage is really important for asking questions about disability. Where is God? What is this thing about praying for physical cure? How does healing relate to physical cure, right? Because you can certainly have healing without cure. So it raises all of these, uh, all of these kinds of questions. Um, so again, John famously uh, has two endings. You already heard the first ending. The second ending goes like this. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. I would say that Jesus is still doing many other things in the lives of each of us. So my question in terms of conversation is how does, does our life individually or in community continue the Jesus story? Thank you. Okay, so we have time for Q&A. So what you thinking? What are your questions, your pushback, your protests? I'm an eight on the Enneagram, if that tells you anything. Eights build intimacy through conflict, so bring it on. Uh, so you mentioned a couple times the importance of community yeah. in interpreting scripture. So what would you say? Yeah. Um, so I'm Baptist. Um, 
And for me, so we have a tendency in the Baptist world to be very overly in, individualized. So even the way we talk about salvation, I mean, obviously any Israelite, any New Testament author, anybody in the Old Testament, right? We're damned together or we're saved together, period. Whether you like it or not, it's how it is. But it's a harder sell for some, some Protestants. And so I think, you know, for me, trying to do what you all do naturally as Catholics, which is we obviously do things together. You know, we don't we don't have any authority outside of our own congregation. We make all our decisions. No one can tell us anything. So the gift of community, of course, is uh, getting out of your own echo chamber. And again, again, the, the passages we're having today, I just can't have all the experiences. I will never walk around in the body of every other kind of body that's not mine. And the only way for me to to work towards making it on earth as it is in heaven is to listen to people who know what they're talking about and then do whatever I can, you know, but I won't know that if I'm just by myself. Right. And what would you add? Um, I would probably, I, hmm. sorry, put you on the spot. Yeah. 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 Because I was curious what motivated the question. I'm always curious about what motivates any question. Uh, I think that, uh, how might tend to uh, have that natural tendency towards uh, being community. And I think the Okay. Oh, interesting. Community yeah. is to bring those, uh, your own interpretation yeah. to say, you also have something valuable to offer to the conversation. Um, and like so, yeah. yeah, so I think both of those do uh, in tandem with each other. Yeah, that's a really good insight. They're kind of two sides of a coin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I love that. I can see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? Thanks for your talk. I thought yeah. it was great. Yeah. Um, near the beginning, you had this line, uh, and I may butcher it, so please it. correct me. <laughs> yeah, uh, the idea that the word must have flesh, the yeah. idea of like the scriptures being in flesh. Yeah, that immediately brought to mind uh, this perpetual angst in uh, Karl Barth about talking about the logos to sarcos, which is a christological claim, but I think it can easily kind of make the jump into a claim about scripture. Can you just talk a little bit more about? how you see that being operative, like what your vision for it fleshed scripture means? Um, it's a, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, so, you know, clearly I'm drawing on John uh, 114 and the notion that Jesus, you know, it's very fascinating to me that Jesus becomes the word and that John can talk about scripture meaning what we what we mean in the Old Testament or whatever, but also Jesus's words become just as authoritative um, uh, as the, the written scriptures, so kind of how, how that works. I mean, I live in the gospel of John. And so it's funny because some people kind of do the Platonism thing with John, right? It says everything is up here, the lo the logos, and, you know, we get it, stoicism and uh, Platonism and, and all of that. But it's, this is why I'm kind of trying to work on this project and drive us back to, because it's incredibly sensual and sensory gospel. You know, why tell us that the grass was green and why tell us that there was such a stench? I mean, you know, or Mary with her hair. I was with a, a bunch of Episcopalians a couple weeks ago, you know, and I asked them to picture, you know, we really dove into that thing. And I was like, picture, you know, her on her knees with her hair on his feet. And there was a gentleman in the room. And I was like, I'm asking everybody to do it because women are typically, we always have to kind of do the translation of like, pretend like we're Peter. And there was a guy in the room who was like, I really can't go there because it's so personal and so, you know, intimate. Um, and that's when I think scripture is doing its thing. Because I don't know, we're a lot of us in here are academics. And so I think there's just this kind of tendency um, to disembody. And so I think somehow engaging scripture where it's just not for our doctrines, that's super important and systematic theology, but we're really, no matter what happens, there's scripture, that back and forth between scripture. This is partially why I'm interested. I mean, I know people aren't going to share these experiences publicly like this, but privately over coffee, I'm loving 
in having coffee with people about their extraordinary spiritual experiences. Some of them are occasioned in different ways that people do or don't want to share with a larger group. But it's interesting to me how if scripture is part of your vocabulary, how it shows up and then what kind of claim it makes on your life, because everybody's in here, I assume, even at dinner last night, which was so delightful. I was able to ask every single one of these wonderful editorial board members, you know, how did you get here? And yeah, we got here because we are smart and care about learning things. But all of us also came here because of some embodied thing. Even, even the stories some of us were telling, right? It was kind of this, when I was this age, I felt, I felt this or I knew this. And that's kind of what I'm getting at. You know, they're all important, but I don't hear us talking as much about it or thinking it's as important. I think we are platonic accidentally. I mean, some of us on purpose, but some of us accidentally. Yeah, it's such a great question. What, what would you say? But well, you don't have to answer. But no, I mean, no it's if okay. You, if you had something you're thinking. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if I had any super. No, okay. I don't have anything that you can steal. Okay. There's nothing of value in there. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, I just think about it from pastoral sensitivities, yeah. pastoring for, for six years before jumping back into a PhD program, uh, trying to communicate the embodiedness um, of the entire Christian vision yes. is really, really important to me. So I'm, I'm tracking with you and I was more so asking the question just to continue to affirm. Yeah. So uh, one tracking. of the books my students love, it's really getting old. I wish you would update it. Uh, it's called A Healing Homiletic. It's on preaching and disability. And just, you know, think about when you preach a cure story who's actually there? And if it's not good news for that person with the chronic illness, it's not good news and you shouldn't preach it. Right. And that's true for everything we talk about, whether it's economics or whatever, if it's not picture, picture that like you did for six years, you pictured, I assume actual people. And once you do that, you're like, Oh, I should not say that. Because how would that land with this person knowing their experience, their pain, what they're struggling with right now? It doesn't mean we can't be bold or have convictions. For sure, we're bold and have convictions. But um, also, I teach a class called Evil, Suffering, and Death um, and Afterlife uh, in the New Testament. You know, I, I say, you know, I have to put, we all have to put these, whatever, these things for ATS, whatever our goals are or whatever. So I put those on the syllabus. It gets published. But on the first day, I say, really, the point of this class is for us to stop saying stupid stuff about suffering. Right. And then ideally, if it's bonus, if we actually say good stuff, because what happens sometimes by the end of the class, the students are so I'm not going to say anything stupid. So then there's the danger. They're not going to say anything because they're afraid of saying something stupid. Like, no, no, no. Our tradition is full of great things to say, i.e. scripture is a good place to start. Like I just told them the other day, when you go to the hospital, you should have not on a piece of paper that can fall out somewhere written inside your Bible. You should have a list of scriptures <laughs> that you can go to when you visit people. So you're not fumbling around people it's here you know and you all i'm baptist so we don't have any book of worship or anything this is all we have but you all have other things that you take to the hospital have good words um, and the people like me just steal them we're like we're baptist we don't have any words but we have in our office the lutheran book of worship and the presbyterian <laughs> and the book of common prayer right um so i'm with you it's just i'm so passionate about it because it's real people's lived bodies and if their bodies are not represented and honored um as they are in our preaching, in our teaching, you know, it's um, it's a missed opportunity for gospel. Yeah. I'm only uh, loosely familiar with Perkins. I've lived in Dallas for a year and a half. Um, I'm assuming you are teaching both um, Methodist ordinance and potentially people going on to teach in secondary school settings, et cetera. Um, it seems a requirement to engage with scripture as inspiration and conversation that we're actually engaging in scriptures. And at least in the, in the Catholic setting, um, I'm a relatively recent convert. My, my perception has been that Catholics are given a, um, uh, sort of, uh, I think I used the analogy the other day. We're we're given a bowl of sort of bland um, 
oatmeal to get us to confirmation at 14. And then there's not much engagement after that, unless you intentionally seek it out. Okay. So I'm wondering as you're engaging with students who are going to go on to teach ordinary people, how are you impressing upon them the value of engaging with the scriptures as a, as a source of inspiration and conversation? How do you make it practical and exciting for yeah. them to actually delve deep? It's a great question. It's what I care about the most. I have chill bumps while you're saying it because um, it's what I live for. Uh, and it takes some time. So part of what I do is I try to model in the classroom what I'm hoping this kind of spaces they they create when they go out, just creating a space where people can kind of come in, have a hook, right? And the more I get to know them, as you were just saying, when you know your people, you know, like, oh, I'm going to open the lecture with this. I'm not going to be like, Sam, this is for you, why I picked this analogy, but I know, and I know if I do that, the person's going to perk up and and get hooked, you know, and then they start imagining and we just kind of do this thing and it takes, I always love it's one month. I don't know if Andrew would agree. It's so usually one month point. The first month is just nothing but building blocks, you know, cause you can't create community. You can't jumpstart it. But um, in other words, it's not me. I, I set the class up in a way that they themselves do encounter scripture and they encounter it with each other by design of the course. And then scripture and the Holy spirit right? They, they just kind of do their thing. And everybody at some point, I think, finds a hook. Or and they can also be like, wow, that's so boring. I can't imagine ever caring about that. I'm really glad you do. But this thing over here is just, I'm on fire about it. So I know that's not a really uh, concrete answer, but I, I really care a lot about pedagogy. And you can read a lot about it. And you can read about, um, so it's when you teach adults, it's called andragogy. Um, kind of unfortunate, because that's the word for man in Greek. But, you know, whatever. I did say that, the learning class. I'm like, can we change the name? And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, in Greek. And they're like, lady, just learn the Bloom's taxonomy um, and you use verbs about what your goals are. Um, but anyway, I care a lot about pedagogy. And 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 the other thing I do is find good teachers. Like So, so think about whoever you've had who's ignited your interest in scripture or ignited your interest in anything and ask, what is it they, how'd they do that? And then copy them or talk to them and see what they're reading or what class they took, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah. I love your question. It's really important because it really does. I mean, again, because when I do idol meet, they're like, why are we gonna talk about idol meet of everything in here? Let's talk about something sexy, like all the sex stuff that's in here, you know, because human sexuality is all the rage. Yes, and that's really important. I never shy away from talking about it, but that's a little bit like low hanging fruit, I think. But if we can kind of read about idol meet, and at the end of the day, say, wow, this first from the eight through 10 is crucial to the Christian life and spiritual formation. Then I've done something, you know, um, and gotten people out of that habit of like, I want to talk about X subject and then go rifling through to find a Bible verse that talks about X subject. Instead of we just get a language, you know, it's the language school of the church and it's opposite way. We don't like have experiences and then go to scripture to, to find what it says, but instead just immerse in it day in, day out. And then whenever you're having experiences, you're like, oh, that's kind of like that, right? But it involves being immersed in it to where it's kind of second nature, I think, you know. Now let's probably have time for one more question. Yes. I love that slide. Uh, I read a book by Makoto Fujimura, The Art uh, at, and faith a theology of making. And I share this book with a group of people and suddenly have the division. Uh, people said, what kind of, like how waste it is to use a gold, precious gold to, uh, I don't know. Yeah, so can you do to bring the art of using scriptures to bring union solidarity instead of divide instead yeah. of yeah that's i think that's true with every you could ask that of every single subject how are we bringing bringing people together but i, I think again it's about creating certain kinds of spaces as much as you can safe spaces curious spaces i'm a huge fan of curiosity and imagination what i call thought experiments you know, and I'm an extrovert. So I was like, trust me, I'm going to say things in this class. I don't even believe. And I'm not going to know I don't believe it until I say it. Because you guys are going to say something and it's going to inspire a thought in me. And then I'm going to say it out loud. And I'm going to be like, oh, no, not really. Um, so creating, I think, certain kinds of spaces where you're also, because I tell my students on the best days, on my best teaching days, I am not trying to create mini Jamie's, you know, because sometimes they'll ask me, what do you think? And I'm like, it doesn't matter what I think. 
in this moment. If you want to know what I think, I'll tell you at length over coffee. But in this space, I'm just here trying to kind of create a space for all of you to talk. Because again, we have people, I don't know if you know the GMC, that's the Global Methodist Church, that there's a split in the Methodist Church. And, and so I've got, even Methodists are no longer kind of a thing. They're now, uh, so every tradition is kind of going through this. So I don't have an easy answer. I just have this kind of embodied thing. Who's really there? Who's there? Where do I want? Where am I hoping to get the group? And who's really there? Instead of like, what did I use last semester or last week at that church to do this? It's different people with different experiences, different contexts. So how can we create the space? And, and I would never early on ever jumpstart getting people to, to go to vulnerable spaces. You know, in other words, this art or whatever, this is about vulnerability. I mean, anytime you're talking about brokenness, you're in the realm of vulnerability and it, it has to be, people have to be together and build some trust I think, I, mean, I hope as Christians, we can like over lunch, I've never met you, but because we're Christians, we can speed that up as opposed to the general population because we have shared values and I would hope shared trust, right? That you would hold what I'm saying. I can already trust because you've made certain commitments to Jesus that make you safer space for me than other people. And yet I still don't know you in all of your embodiment and social context. So it's such a great question. I mean, do you have an answer? yourself that you I think to build a share vision among the group is important but for me the process of have, have that sharing not as an ending a process yeah. to bring us together uh, belong to the group but don't ex exclude the differences and yes. how we can have open listening real listening to to hear what other people really want to say not assume that we understand their thought yes yeah. oh that's so beautifully said that's beautifully said oh well i think um, my time is up so i think maybe i'll take uh, take a cue from you and end with a poem that i love because it's written um it's written do you all know killian mcdonald so he is a catholic have you met him i it's on my bucket list and um uh, he's at in Collegeville, so I think it's going to happen. Uh, and I've written to him because I would love his stuff is not available on audio. I also care. That's the other thing, you know, everything related to disability, so much stuff not accessible to our siblings with various embodiments that should be uh, in this day and age. Anyway, so I'll close with this. Um, it's called Perfection, Perfection. And I love it because, um, again, the, the model from 2 Corinthians 12 and kind of what we're talking about in scripture um, in our lives. And also he didn't start writing poetry. He's a monk. He didn't start writing poetry till he was 70. Um, and I just love this. And so uh, the poem is called Perfection, Perfection. And it starts with Psalm 101, verse two, I will walk the way of perfection. He says this, I've had it with perfection. I have packed my bags. I am out of here, gone. As certain as rain will make you wet, Perfection will do you in. It droppeth not as dew upon the summer grass to give liberty and green joy. Perfection straineth out the quality of mercy, withers rapture at its birth. Before the battle is half begun, cold probity thinks it can't be won, concedes the war. I've handed in my notice, given back my keys, signed my severance check, I quit. Hence, I could have taken even the perfect chiseled form of Michelangelo's radiant David squints. The Venus de Milo has no arms. The Liberty Bell is cracked. Thank you. <laughs>